Welcome to the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, your resource for clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships in healthcare. Learn how to earn letters of recommendation, prepare for your clerkship, and excel at patient care from preceptors with years of practice. We interview physician educators in every specialty and clinical setting to discuss how to prepare for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Here's your host and MedEd entrepreneur, Chase DeMarco. On today's show, we have Dr. Allison Edwards of Kansas City Direct Primary Care. She's been a preceptor for over three years, including teaching at the University of Colorado and the University of Kansas. Allison, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Brief introduction about you. What got you into teaching and how have your experiences been so far? I own my own direct primary care practice, and I'm very much in the community outside of the ivory tower of academia. But my entire training obviously had been in academics from, you know, med school through my residency at the University of Colorado. And so that was very near and dear to my heart, and I didn't want to lose it. And so immediately upon graduation from residency, I began to set the foundation for continuing my relationships with both the University of Colorado, my alma mater, and then locally here in Kansas City, the University of Kansas keep that alive. Awesome. And you mentioned direct primary care. So for the audience that is not aware of what DPC is, can you briefly describe that? I would love to, of course. I I will warn you that if you start asking me about direct primary care, I will not stop talking about direct primary care because I think it's amazing. That seems to be a common theme. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So I I grew up uh, having never really worked for large corporations or, or large industries. i kind of grew up in a relatively mid-sized town and had been a server and a barista and things like that. And so the first taste of, of working in a corporate setting was actually residency. And over that three-year period, which by the way, for any residents or you know students listening, residency is hard and there's, there's no question, right? That 10,000 hours is a difficult 10,000 hours to get. But at the same time, like this was hard on a different level because I felt that the system in which I was working was more of the problem than just the hard hours and the slog. And as I got further and further in my residency career, I realized more and more that I, I was essentially, I was working for the person who signed my paycheck. And the person who signed my paycheck was that big university system. And then by default, also the insurers that were paying for, for my patient's care. And so I wasn't working for my patients. I was working for large institutions that had nothing to do with the person sitting in the exam room with me. That was bothersome, especially with my background and always being sort of small business oriented. And so my poor residency director and attendings knew that I was going to do this. And I think they were very tolerant of it. But I was like, I'm going to go out. I'm going to work directly for my patients. And so so we've done that. We've removed the middleman. So we don't do any insurance billing. And we offer our services in primary care for $65 a month. And at our clinic, we don't charge any copays. People can come in as often as they need to or not. There are some people we don't see for months on end. And then they can also reach out by phone. We can do phone visits. They can contact me by email. We really try and put you know, the patient first and not just lip service to that, but quite literally the economic model is a line that if a patient doesn't like what we're doing, they will simply leave and they don't pay us. And so we do have to give our patients a really good experience for them to come back. Awesome. I know just recently I was discussing direct primary care on my other show, the Medical Anemonist podcast, and uh, it's surprising how many people are still not aware of this and especially students. I know I wasn't Mm -hmm. until shortly before my first rotation in DPC, and I'd really like to share this experience or this philosophy of medicine with the audience. Absolutely. I had the honor last week to speak at the American Academy of Family Physicians at their National uh, Students and Residents Conference as one of the opening keynote, one of the plenary speakers to essentially say, you know, this is this is family medicine, right? It's it's on the it's on the ground and it's working for the community and in the community and, and for your patients directly. It was a really cool experience and there were a ton of students interested in DPC. So I think you're you're on the right track. It's a really positive bright light in family medicine. So for your particular institute what types of students do you have? Is it only MD and DO? Do you have nurse practitioners? Do you allow student shadowing? Great question. So I, I feel terribly about, I, I just feel so sorry for every student that has to shadow at our clinic because, or has to, you know, precept at our clinic because we have such low volume by design, right? I'm on retainer for my patients. If all is well, they don't come in. And so there's a lot of downtime. And so for that reason, we don't take NP students because 
they have a lot of check boxes they have to, you know, they have to see a certain number of patients, et cetera. And frankly, we are going to set them up for failure. So we, at the very beginning, say, you know, this is not going to be a good fit. Although we love that that people are interested in DPC, simply from an educational standpoint, you're not going to get the volume you need. We do see DO and MD students. Both of the universities I work with obviously train MDs. So that's the majority of the students that we have. And the flow is, is very interesting. It can change from day to day. And we've done all sorts of different things with our students when they, when they come and work with us. So still quite a variety of students, even though they might be limited on some of the experiences that they can receive. Correct. The limitation with training in direct primary care is simply a volume thing. A lot of training is, you know, getting book smart, knowing the pathology, knowing the physiology. And then a lot of that is the clinical practice. And you get better at clinical practice the more times you see certain situations or zebras or, you know, and everything in between. And in direct primary care, we do see a lot of zebras. Don't get me wrong. People who have not accessed care walk in my door all the time with just crazy stuff going on. But at the same time, I'm only seeing eight patients a day some of whom understandably don't necessarily want patient or uh, students involved in their care. And so volume just gets really low. So I, I wish that were different for the student's sake, but for my sake and the way I run my clinic, it's perfect. And it sounds like there's a lot of good study time too. So if students need a break from a previously very intensive rotation, this would be a great one to fit in between. Oh my gosh. I, that is part of our intro to every student's rotation with us is that they have to bring things to entertain themselves because I will talk way too much at them, not even with them. It's probably an at them thing. Um, I feel so bad for our students, but anyway, it's because it's fun. We love what we do. (laughs) So a few questions about preceptors as a DPC preceptor. What do you think makes a good or a great preceptor in your specialty? So in direct primary care, the best preceptors are the ones who are the are the ones who are going to light that fire of, of entrepreneurship and independence in a student. Between medical school and residency, you're going to get a phenomenal uh, medical training, just inherently. That's that's the way it's designed. And so what's unique about direct primary care is that we are thousands of doctors nationwide, just over a thousand, I should say, at this point, nationwide, who have set out to start our own practices and really taken a leap of faith. And so the great preceptors in DPC are the ones that can answer those questions and to really build up confidence in students and residents that they actually can go out and do their own thing. Are there any skills or unsafe practices that a potential preceptor should be aware of? As far as unsafe preceptorship in direct primary care, we identify as a group, as a a bunch of cowboys and cowgirls out there on the frontiers of pushing the limits of what is possible and what we can do in primary care. And so that's always going to be a personal limit for every single person. You know, what is the breadth of your training? What is safe for patients? What is not? And certainly bringing students along on that ride can inherently invites, you know, the question of, you know, is this safe for a student to feel like that this is a reasonable thing to be doing in a primary care clinic? I hope, I think that makes sense, but just, and that's the same in any profession, right? Like you should absolutely act within your own capabilities at all times. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there any potential mistakes that you've noticed in the past that either yourself or other uh, physicians have made that might've led to a great learning experience? I think any student listening to your podcast or any preceptor has had an experience where an attending or a resident above them has ma- maybe not treated them fairly, expected too much, hasn't communicated well. There's, we've all had bad experiences with the people above us. To sort of flip that question, I don't think I was a very good student, actually, because I blame myself perhaps pathologically, but I, I never took ownership of my patients, right? I, it was never, I never had the mentality of if I were the person taking care of this patient, what would I do? If I were, if the buck stopped with me as a second year, third year, fourth year student, as an intern, you know, like ultimately taking responsibility of that patient truly is going to be the best way to learn because that's where you start to push yourself and force yourself to make decisions and to come up with a plan and to really stake your, your thoughts. And are you going to screw up? Oh, absolutely. You're always going to make mistakes, Um, even as attendings you do. But you need to start that process early. And so while it wasn't an overt mistake that any preceptor specifically made or, or that I felt I received as I was learning, it was almost an internal thing that it never flipped on for me until my intern year when all of a sudden I realized that the buck kind of did stop with me at that point. And I had this whole existential crisis and moved on and have, have done quite well. I use that with my students. I say, you know, when they're presenting to me, I, I want a plan. You know, I want an assessment and I want a plan. And guess what? You're going to be wrong. And that's fine. You might be right. But I need you to go through those actions because making mistakes is how we learn. 
I love it. I think a lot of students and preceptors are afraid to mention some of their mistakes, especially some that might be personal uh, development areas that haven't haven't quite developed yet. So I love that you shared that. And I'm sure a lot of other students can relate to that exact mentality and not really noticing that they have it or not sure how to get out of that state at the time. And I challenge preceptors and residents to really encourage your learners to get to that point. Because if you don't have that pressure from above, also it's a lot harder to make yourself uh, feel that importance. I think that's a great segue to the one minute preceptor model. So what is a way that you've used this or currently use this in your specialty, in your practice? So the first step is getting a commitment from the student. Oh, students hate this. I'm so sorry. I apologize to every student out there when you're attending or resident says, and what are your goals today? What would you like to learn today? Both from like setting an agenda perspective, but also getting a commitment to on the back end, like I was talking about, about making that assessment and plan. In addition to my clinic, I volunteer at a, a free clinic that's entirely student run. It's a really cool thing here in Kansas City. It's called JDoc. Similar programs exist nationwide. And I say, what, what feedback can I give you at the end? What are you looking to improve on? But if I ask that at the beginning, then while I'm listening to them present, I can give more pointed feedback that's more meaningful. And I think that's a very important thing to do. By asking that question, I'm able to frame my feedback in a way that's more meaningful rather than having me just arbitrarily give unsolicited feedback. I think that's important. I'm sure they benefit from it greatly. The second step is probing for supporting evidence. So how would you go about doing that in your practice? So when it comes to uh, making a great assessment and plan, Obviously, we have to have a theoretical basis and a background for making that assessment and plan. And so a lot of that is a dynamic conversation. And I I do torture my students. I make them do a full presentation. They have to get all the way through it. I don't interrupt. You have to finish. You've got to do your assessment plan. And again, throw that spaghetti at the wall before we can have that conversation. But especially, this is true in family medicine, is that you're never going to learn the entire breadth of medical knowledge ever, ever, ever. You're just, it's, there's so much out there, as you know, it doubles, you know, every couple of years, there's so much to learn. And so the point is not necessarily to know everything off the top of your head. And I know that's a little bit blasphemous to say, but for me, the point is to learn how to learn, right? And so what are your resources? How are you using them? How are you using them effectively? How are you taking a critical eye to your resources up to date? I need to know all those things. And I need to know how you're thinking in order for me to understand how you're processing and, and frankly, how you're going to be as, as a, somebody who has to think in a very sequential manner um, to bring a lot of data together to create the best plan for a patient down the road. I think that's perfect. We cover a lot of learning how to learn type strategies in the Medical and Eminence podcast. And it's, it's very true. The material itself should not be necessarily your entire focus as uh, much as learning how to take the next steps. Information is constantly going to change and you need to be able to keep up with it more so than memorize whatever is considered a fact today. The third step is reinforcing what has been done well. So how do you go about this in your practice? I I feel like every med student never hears when I say that there's something that they did well because they're too busy anticipating here to like they're ready to hear what they did wrong. It's sort of like that feedback sandwich that everybody hates where it's like, I really like how you did this. You totally screwed up on this, but don't worry, you're doing great on this. Like nobody hears the good stuff. Everybody always is focused on the the bad stuff, but it's super important. Your question is, how do you do it? And you just acknowledge when people do well and find that that silver lining because everybody has is doing something well just to, to recognize. And when a student makes some sort of error or omits information that was mandatory for the diagnosis or for the problem they were trying to solve, how can you give guidance for those errors or omissions? So this is hard because, especially as a student, it can feel really hostile when somebody who is above you in sort of the medical hierarchy starts questioning what you've said and could potentially even do it in a in an abusive way. That's that's don't, that's not what we want ever. I invite the Socratic method a lot when I'm having a discussion with students because everybody has, you know, you have a great foundation of science. And so if we can start to ask questions that are a little bit more probing, we can get to a better, better response. So for example, I had a I believe he was a it was a rising second year student who I precepted with on Monday, and he was telling me about a type one a patient who has type one diabetes whose cataracts were so bad. He's young, really sad story. Young twenty three year old guy, but had terrible cataracts. Couldn't actually see to give himself insulin, so had not given himself insulin for four days. And so this first transitioning to second year student said, you know, I'm going to get an A one C to see how well he's controlled. Um, I'm going to hook him up with insulin. 
in my mind, I was like, well, hold up. We have a type one diabetic who hasn't had insulin for four days. Like that's very concerning to me for a lot more urgent things than what's his A1C and we need to get him insulin. And so working through that, it was questions like, tell me, you know, what happens? Like how, how does type one diabetes work, right? Like it's pancreatic insufficiency. So what happens when you don't have, have insulin coursing through your blood? You know, where does the glucose go? And then what other metabolic pathways are happening? What are the byproducts of these metabolic pathways? And oh yes, there's acid that can build up. And what do we, you know, what do we call this? It's called, you know, diabetic ketoacidosis. And so in the oversight that that student committed, it was actually an opportunity to review the basic physiology leading to DKA. So it wasn't a penalty, but rather a reason to go back to the basics. And it can feel like you're doing something wrong the whole time we're going through that. And I'm saying this on the other side, so I know it's it's so hard to hear, but that anxiety that you're feeling is going to create a much better learning opportunity than if you didn't, you know, pin down an assessment and plan and like try to at least come up with something. You're going to be a better learner by being wrong, honestly. As long as you are in a comfortable, supportive environment, being wrong is a, is, is a really, really important learning tool. I'm sorry. And that's a key right there is a supportive environment that's sometimes yeah. difficult to find. And I think a lot of what you said actually goes into step five of the one minute preceptor model, which is teaching a general principle. So right. with your example, kind of cover both of those, teaching the general principle about mechanisms of action, how the disease actually progresses before going straight into the treatment of said diagnosis. Regarding students, what do you expect from students when they start your rotation? I have terribly low expectations. I want people to show up and I want them to be clean and I want them to be respectful. And because again, my business model focuses on customer service, kindness, and creating a welcoming environment, it, that is of paramount importance to me. You have to be kind and you have to treat my patients with respect and you have to run on time and ultimately give them a good experience. Um, so I'm very, 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 very careful with the amount of freedom and latitude that I give uh, students because they really have to fit our brand. As pathetic as that sounds, they really do. I can't have patients offended <laughs> by students. I can't have them annoyed by students. I can't have them, you know, we run on time and we run a tight ship. And so if a student interview delays my patient for you know, 20 to 30 minutes, that puts them off their schedule and that delays their day. We don't do that. And so my expectations are really to jive with the business, which is not hard to do. And, and students kind of fall into a step with that um, as they're here for a prolonged period of time. And customers must love that they're actually in and out on time instead of waiting for 30, 40 minutes before being seen. Yeah, exactly. And we want, we want to make sure that we keep that as our focus. Are there any ways that a student can best prepare for a rotation with you? The best preparation is to have that open mind and that open attitude and, and honestly to just be positive, right? Like I, I and my patients really enjoy having people who are excited to learn and who are excited to have an opportunity. Additionally, because there is a lot of downtime because we don't have as many patients, I do appreciate it when students come in with either a project that they want to accomplish or specific questions that they want to ask me or something along those lines so that we can keep them engaged even during our downtime. That's important. All right. Are there any particular skills or ways that a student might excel or if they're looking for a letter of recommendation, things you would recommend they do? Letters of recommendation. Oh my, it's been so long since I've thought about this. The students who resonate with me, the students who, when they leave my office, I sit down and immediately type out a letter of recommendation are the ones who are passionate about what they're doing, more specifically passionate about their experience that they've had here at our direct primary care clinic. And not everybody has to be passionate about direct primary care. I don't expect that. But when somebody, and this is true of any profession in any part of life, when you work with somebody who is excited about what they're doing, passionate about what they're doing, they ask good questions, they go the extra mile, not because they feel like, you know, they're not a gunner and they're doing it, you know, for the letter, but they're doing it because they truly feel that way. Writing a letter of recommendation becomes a very easy process because that person is inherently suited and passionate about what, what we're talking about. And so it's hard to manufacture that. So it's so if somebody's asking me what they could do to get a good letter of recommendation, I think they've already missed the point. <laughs> because if you are inherently passionate about what you're doing, you're going to get that amazing review. And so be true to yourself, step up, help, uh, ask, how can I help you? What can I do to help your patients? If you see low-hanging fruit that could be done better, you know, ask, can, what do you think about me creating a handout for hypertension for your patients? It looks like you don't have one, right? All of those things show that, which we do, by the way, we have one, but you know, that's, that shows that, that somebody's actively thinking they're engaged and they're excited about what we're doing. And that's, that's what matters. Just side note, are there more students that they rotate with you for a core rotation or for electives? Or do you know? 
KU is always changing their curriculum. So I'm probably going to be corrected as wrong here if I say something out loud. But essentially, it used to be that uh, students would come for like a one month elective, which was great. And we would take one student at a time. And that student was obviously passionate. I mean, that's why they were with us was because they wanted to do direct primary care. And then they switched to a model where every quarter there was a week where students could be in the community. And so we've actually had people get uh, lotteried into our clinic, some of whom are not interested in what we do really at all. And so those experiences as a preceptor are much, much harder because you're dealing with somebody who's really not interested in what you're doing which is partly my job to create interest and to really bring people in because that's what educators are supposed to do. Like we all have to go through things we don't like, but it's a, um, it's a much better experience when I'm working with somebody who's really interested and passionate about what we do. Are there any particular mistakes that you've noticed from past students, something to be aware of for future students that might rotate with you or in a similar practice? I'm going to totally contradict what I said earlier. When a student oversteps their knowledge and their expertise that is, con- that's, I think, the biggest mistake I see with students is that I want, I do, I really want students to take ownership. But what I don't want is for them to be in a room with a patient, gather history, do a limited exam, and then tell the patient what's going on, and then come out to precept with me when we decided something totally different. And now we have to backtrack with the patient. We're a team, as far as I'm concerned. And so I, while I do want you to create that assessment and plan, I don't want it to be shared with the patient until we're on the same page. And and when that happens, it's uh, it's frustrating again, because my whole model is about the best possible patient experience. And when we're contradicting ourselves and making people anxious or nervous with concerning speculation, frankly, that is not a good patient experience. And so like any team, like any dynamic, like any workplace, I want to be on the same team as my students. And so, you know, know your limits. Again, with me personally in a safe space, I want you to push those limits because I want you to learn. But playing with somebody's emotion or like future health while you're experimenting is not really ideal. That makes perfect sense. Are there any particular resources that you would recommend for students, whether this be a a review book, websites, QBanks, anything along those lines? I'm in a really uh, niche part of medicine in that I'm in family practice, operating my own small business. And so the resources that are important to me right now are not necessarily the ones that were important to me when I was in, you know, preparing for step one or, or what have you, or boards or shelf exams. I think that other speakers can uh, attest to all of those resources much better than I can. Although I think I still, I'm going to mess this up. UWorld QBank, do I have that right? Yes, that's still the most popular one, I believe. I wish that I could keep taking those. Those were phenomenal questions and they're really, really great at preparing you for standardized tests. And I really like standardized tests. So I actually enjoy doing those questions. Sorry to everybody out there. (laughs) I do not agree. (laughs) I know, I'm sorry. I love... To, for me, test taking is a game and there are explicit rules and there's one right answer. So you have to learn the rules and like the setups and the props that the question writers are using to get you to that one answer. And so once you like those questions are written so beautifully that any other tests that you take from like then on into the future, you're like, oh, these questions are written so poorly because there's multiple possible answers and they don't set up their logic correctly. And I think I should have been an engineer in another life. I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, I digress. But as a family physician running my own business, I have uh, a unique set of resources that I look to. So um, I'm a small business owner, which means that I have to rely heavily on resources available in the community for entrepreneurs and small business owners. And there are tons and tons of them. A lot of them are free resources. Speaking locally uh, in Kansas City, we have like the Kansas City Startup Foundation. Federally, there are small business development centers that are funded throughout the nation where you can go and have one-on-one coaching with a business coach who can, again, for free to you, it's being funded by the government, um, you can get coaching on setting up a business plan and a profit and loss statement and projections and all that. And so there are a lot of resources out there to be a successful small business owner, since it's a skill set that most of us don't acquire in med school, but it's possible. It's absolutely possible. And I know a lot of your listeners, this is very much down the road, but just, just to know that you don't have to, you don't have to be an employed physician when you get to the other side, you can certainly uh, make a go of it as your own business owner. I think the SBA, the Small Business Association, is one of those. They provide mentorship and a lot of free resources as well. Any DPC-related materials? Oh, well, thank you for asking this. <laughs> I am honored to be part of the group of physicians who established the Direct Primary Care Alliance. We founded it uh, in late 2017, launched last year, and have brought on our executive director this 
of founding, you know, essentially a trade uh, association is, is fascinating. But the Direct Primary Care Alliance has a lot of direct primary care resources. Phil Eskew runs a uh, an organization called DPC Frontier, has a lot of uh, legal advice. He's a, a lawyer in addition to being a physician. There's a couple of other resources that are put out there by the vendors that support the DPC community. So I'm thinking about like Atlas MD, they run an EHR. They have a really great startup checklist. Bagel MD, also another EHR, has a, has a very comprehensive startup checklist. Um, Hint Health runs conferences and has a lot of other stuff. And then, of course, the AAFP, the American Academy of Family Physicians, does a lot of work in the DPC community and hosts an annual summit. Oh, and then the Docs for Patient Care Foundation out of Florida has an annual conference as well that's focused on direct primary care. Like you did, Chase, well, you reached out to mentors and were able to uh, go around in the front range there around Denver. Like, There's so much to be learned about direct primary care, and all of us are super passionate about what we do, so we're happy to chat. All right. Are there any parting thoughts for students? Good luck. <laughs> I am, I, I just, I love, I love working with students. And even though I have my small little practice, I made it a point to keep students in my world because I think that as much as attendings, you feel like you're beholden to us. There's nothing like being asked a great question by a student to keep me on my toes. And so good luck to everyone listening. And a big thank you to all the students out there who, you know, tolerate us attendings and all of our crazy questions because it's just as beneficial for us as it is for you. Any last minute thoughts for potential future preceptors? <sighs> Don't be jerks. <laughs> I am so tired of the medical hierarchy just like disseminating jerkdom down from the top to the bottom. <laughs> agreed. Completely agreed. I think that when critical errors are made, I mean, that's why we have m and right? Like that's why we, that's why we're really robust about the way that we assess critical errors. But hundreds of errors and hundreds of mistakes and hundreds of oversights happen every day in every medical setting and to be kind and and address those with grace because we're all learning and we all make mistakes i think to every preceptor out there you know your students are your future team members train them up but treat them with dignity sounds good great advice dr allison edwards of kansas city drug primary care thank you so much for coming on the show today thank you for having me chase good luck to everybody out there <laughs>